Hello everyone, uh, it's Rich from PC Games N here. We're here at E3 2017 and we're very excited to be joined by Josh Sawyer, Design Director on Pillars of Eternity 2. Uh, I think I'd like to start by talking a little bit about um, the move to FIG, right? A new crowdfunding platform. Kickstarter did great for you guys this time around, but you've just uh, broken $4.5 million on FIG. Well, I say just, that's when the Kickstarter yeah. closed, right? <laughs> um, what was behind the move to FIG? Well, uh, I think most of that was driven by our CEO, Fergus Urquhart. Um, and I think the desire was just to bring in a, a, a larger potential pool of, of investors and backers and things like that. We wanted to do crowdfunding again because we had a very good experience with it on the first project. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of good experience getting great feedback from the fans. And uh, as far as the particulars of it, that's mostly Fergus's call. But, you know, we knew we wanted to go the crowdfunding route. So sure. I think it was the choice this time. Well, yeah, I mean, famously, the first time around, uh, you guys were in, 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 in trouble, would it be fair to say, before um, yeah. the original Pillars of Eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it was a great, great success. Um, what has the success of the first one and of the FIG campaign enabled you to achieve uh, in the sequel in terms of ambition and scale? We've really tried to scope up the game, uh, especially in terms of like overall features. So Pillars 1, uh, I think we're all very happy with how it came out, but we knew that it could be a lot stronger. Yeah. Uh, could be stronger graphically, could be uh, stronger in terms of certain gameplay elements, things like the Stronghold. Uh, players really, I think, fairly criticized that they weren't quite as well developed as we had wanted them to be. Right. So for Pillars 2, we didn't want to radically change the formula, but we did want to revisit pretty much every aspect of the game and try to improve it in some way. Uh, we made enough money on, on Pillars 1 to start the funding and development of Pillars 2, mm -hmm. but the crowdfunding has allowed us to increase the scope of the game, uh, add in things like all the, the ship crew system, which is yeah. it's actually a lot more involved than I originally expected it to be, but it's really good. It's very, very cool. Um, I think players are really going to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I'll go into it a little bit of detail, but uh, sure. But the I guess the thing is like, you know, people, I think, and Pillars 1 with a stronghold, they never really felt like they got to be the Lord of the Keep. Okay. And with your ship and your crew, you do really feel like you're the captain, the captain of the ship sea, and you're yeah. managing your crew and stuff like that. So details coming. Yeah. But um, it really did allow us to just increase the scope and uh, we're really happy with all the polish and work we've been able to put into it. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about that because, I mean, the, the, the move to, uh, you know, an ocean going and slightly more open sort of world structure and things, um, that's quite exciting and it's a bit of, bit of a departure from the first one for sure. Uh, what uh, new experiences are you hoping to sort of deliver to the player as a result of those changes? Uh, we want the player to feel like they really have a sense of discovery when they go out into the world. Right. So in Pillars 1 we did have wilderness areas, but the wilderness areas weren't always full of like a lot of really exciting content. And so people could discover neat things in them, but a lot of that was conditional on certain like having a certain quest or things like that. And with the open world uh, map, it really allows them to sort of pick a course and just go in that direction and see what they find. Um, more similar to a game like Fallout 1 or Fallout 2 where you have a whole world that you start out just knowing a little part of and then you explore and, and find things as you go. And the way that we lay it out, we try to do it in such a way that, you know, let's say you're on a quest and you're on the way from point A to point B, you're gonna see something off to the side, like right. point C and you're like, then you go out of your way and you realize like, oh wait, these islands are kind of connected. I can't go through that way. I have to go around. And you might get an encounter with an enemy ship captain along the way. So it's all these things that are sort of just a sense of discovery and more, not random, but just like your story is more dynamic based on kind of when you choose to go off the path and what you choose to do. Right. So little secrets hidden here mm -hmm. and there for us to go. Sounds Definitely. good. Um, and uh, one of the most appealing things for me about these sorts of games um, is the fact that sort of like, you know, overla overlapping systems and things enable players to uh, solve an encounter or overcome an obstacle in lots of different ways, you know, whether that's uh, interacting with NPCs or combat or stealth and all these other systems. Um, have you uh, revised or expanded on, on those in the sequel? Is that an area you've focused on? Yeah, I mean, we a lot of us have a very heavy pen and paper background, yeah. and we take a lot of our experiences out of our the games that we play, and one of the most exciting things is when players sort of concoct their own like means of getting through something. And uh, we also knew that people had some problems with the way that our skills system worked in Pillars 1 because it was very, very focused. There were only five skills. Mm -hmm. So we have many more skills. Uh, some of them are more uh, like color and flavor skills. Those are called passive skills and they're separated from the active skills which are the ones that you use more within the world, like stealth. We also have uh, 
actually, I don't know if we settled on the name, but it's basically pickpocketing. So okay. you can actually pickpocket people, um, herbalism, alchemy, all these different things. And those can allow you different dialogue options. They can allow you to craft different things. Uh, in the case of pickpocketing, it can allow you to, for example, steal things off of people that are part of a quest without having to kill them. Okay. Uh, so that, that opens up a lot of different possibilities for how players can complete objectives. Okay, and what about on the social side? I mean, you alluded to earlier um, you know, the crew members who are you know, a lot more uh, evolved or developed mm -hmm. than you had originally envisaged. Um, in, in what ways, and does that extend to NPCs elsewhere in the world? So there are a couple of things I can talk about. One is that we now have dialogue-specific skills. Those are part of the, uh, the, the passive skills because they only come up in conversations. So those skills, things like diplomacy, will come up uh, as options for you to explore. But a big change is that, and a lot of people have requested this, is that companions also contribute to your score. Right. So for example, if you have three characters that all have points in bluff or something like that, then you actually benefit from that as well. I see, okay. So the, there, it's called the party assist system, and you can actually hover over and see like, this is your score and this is how your companions are contributing to it. Right, um, So like there's whispering hints in your Yeah, ears. exactly, like, well, they're all really intimidating, everyone's just, you know, kind of yeah. getting in, the, in their face. <laughs> um, you know, as always, your attributes do play a part in conversation. And then uh, with the crew, a lot of the times you'll find yourself in various dilemmas where the crew members have, uh, you know, some of the crew members will say, like, you should really do this. And the other ones are saying, no, 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 that's a really bad idea. Like, okay. you should actually do it this way. And there's always supposed to be these sort of, like, trade-offs um, with our little interactions, whether they're scripted interactions or encounters at sea. Mm. Um, and how you play those out will always have some positives and some negatives. So uh, choice and consequence is a big part of what makes an Obsidian game uh, an Obsidian yeah. game. So we're, sure. we're just keep, keep pushing that as much as possible. Sounds good. Um, but on that, I mean, you guys basically started the sort of current boom that we're seeing in isometric old school style RPGs, what with, uh, you know, the Kickstarter for the original coming in 2012, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is way before, you know, something like a Divinity Original Sin or, 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 or whatever. Um, and yet, you know, do you reckon we're sort of starting to see the sort of early signs of genre fatigue, perhaps, because, you know, your other title, uh, Tyranny, mm -hmm. sold below expectations, I think um, it, was, it was said. Uh, is that something that you're worried about? Uh, and if so, how is Divinity, how is Pillars 2 freshening the formula up? Um, I don't think we're quite at a point of fatigue. I mean, it's hard for me to know, but um, we obviously we had a lot of excitement about uh, around the crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's hard to match the excitement of the initial comeback. So right. I don't think we're gonna, you know, like just keep hitting that peak over and over again. Yeah. But I also don't think that people are getting you know, tired of this sort of game, or even that there's really like so many of these games that people can't continue to enjoy them. Um, whether it's, you know, Torment Nights, uh, or uh, Tides of Numenera, yeah. um, you know, Divinity, the Shadowrun games, like there are a lot of cool games out there. Loads, but yeah. I don't think that so many are coming out that people are just like, oh, you know what, I've had enough of these. So that's my belief anyway. Yeah, cool. I mean, I certainly have. <laughs> I know I haven't had enough. Um, and lastly, with some exceptions, you know, the history of Obsidian uh, and your big successes, there's a lot of other IPs in that, mm -hmm. sort of other people's IPs. Um, and now you've got uh, a, a current legitimate big success. I mean, as you mentioned, this, this, you know, the interest in the, the FIG campaign is, must be quite encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, do you see maybe the Pillars uh, IP in other contexts in the future? You know, it's speculative, of course, but you know, can you see you guys using it in the future in any other ways, in any other genres maybe? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so we've already had a, a board game that we collaborated with. Uh, yeah. Zero Radius Games made Lords of the Eastern Reach, which is a Pillars of Eternity board game. Um, I'm writing uh, the basics, uh, basic elements for the Pillars of Eternity pen and paper game. Um, and we've also talked about other ideas ranging from a turn-based tactical combat game uh, to something that's more in the vein of like a first person open world exploration game. Okay, great. So I certainly something, think- Something a bit like Skyrim maybe? Yeah, or? I mean like yeah. I, I certainly think a game like that would be possible and I know a lot of uh, people at Obsidian would be excited to work on something like that. Sure. So that's not my choice to do, like that's that's up to, to Fergus, but like right. the, I think there's a lot of possibilities for it. And that's one of the nice things about the IP being ours is that you know it's our choice what, what sort of things we want to explore. And obviously some of that is gonna be dictated by Opportunity, like how big mm. is Obsidian? What do we got going on? What does the market actually look like? Can we do we think a game like this is viable? Because that's always a question. Um, yeah. Just because we want to make something <laughs> doesn't mean that people want to buy it. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I think there's there's tons of stuff we could do with that IP. Cool. It's very exciting to hear. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. 
Um, and thank you guys very much for tuning in. Uh, we'll have plenty more from E3 2017 on the site and on the rest of our YouTube channel, as always. So like, share, subscribe, all the usual social media stuff. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.